All right, HR students, today we're going to be taking a very brief look at the world of rewards and compensation. What are we talking about? How we recognize people for performance through pay and other kinds of rewards. So what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about what total rewards and compensation actually are. If you remember from our discussions, if somebody who makes $100,000 a year with full benefits, they're actually making about $130,000. So where does another $30,000 come from on top of the tangible benefits of the $100,000? What about some of the, the laws uh, governing compensation? We're talking about things like overtime. We're also going to talk about different types of compensation, whether it's base pay, salary, or other kinds of variable pay. We're also going to talk about other ways you can incentivize people and their performance and how we can measure how effective our compensation systems are. So what are total rewards? It's basically anything that somebody gets for working. Uh, it can be tangible or intangible. It can be cash. It can be benefits. They're things that people get for working. What are our rewards? I worked, so I got an A. I worked, so I got a paycheck. We also have to do all of these things within the law and in a way that is equitable. So these things, guys, also serve the idea of giving people motivation and also enhancing performance for the organization, meaning if you pay people well, they tend to work pretty well. They also make it easier for us to recruit good people, good benefits, good compensation, good rewards, recruit good people, and they make the organization more noteworthy. So what are tangible rewards? Those are things that are easily measured, that, that are, are, are easily uh, quantified, for example, uh, if we've got tangible rewards, uh, you're getting paid time off, you're getting a paycheck, that's a tangible reward. Intangible rewards are things that are less quantifiable. Satisfaction, recognition, things like that. Base pay means, for example, what you make for doing your job. It can be your basic compensation before overtime if you're an hourly worker. It could mean, for example, if, you're, if you work on salary plus commission. Uh, if you're a salesperson, your salary is your base pay. And then, again, another term for this can be your wages. Uh, how much time did you work? If you, uh, if you earn an hourly wage, you get paid by the hour. Somebody who is salary, for example, does not get paid by the hour. They are exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act. It means they get paid the same no matter what they work. There are reasons why you pay people salary versus hour, hourly. Then you've got uh, variable pay, which means that you are getting paid based on performance. So variable pay, uh, variable, pay var variable pay technically is also can, can be hourly pay as well. And we get something called the benefit, which means basically everybody gets a specific benefit. So for example, if you're a member of an organization, maybe we all get health insurance, maybe we all get dental, maybe we all get vision, but that still has a cash value to it. So the Fair Labor Standards Act basically set the key acts of employment. Prior to the FLSA, we didn't have things like a minimum wage. So the provisions were basically you got a minimum wage, uh, it varies by state or whether or not you're a federal employee, but we there's a minimum hourly wage. Now, there are exceptions to that. Uh, limits on the use of child labor. Prior to the Fair Labor Standards Act, you would commonly see children working in mining and industrial operations. And then you also have overtime. Generally speaking, if you work over 40 hours a week and you're an hourly employee, with certain exceptions, you get time and a half pay or compensatory time, which means if you work over 40 hours, you're entitled to be paid overtime or to have time and a half off to make up for the extra time that you worked and get paid for it. And we're going to talk about what the difference is between exempt and non-exempt. So the Fair Labor Standards Act set the minimum wage, uh, and the only way to change it again is an act of Congress, quite literally. Then you get into child labor, for example. Uh, generally speaking, you've got to be uh, 18 years old to work in hazardous environments, and you also uh, can, can uh, work uh, limited hours between the ages of 16 and 18. The individuals who are 14 and 15 years old can work outside of school hours with certain limitations. Mainly, we're talking family businesses. Family businesses basically can have anybody at any age working for pretty much any time, <laughs> sort of outside the law. Uh, let's talk about when exempt employees. Th this is something we're, we're moving very quick because this is a very quick coverage of this chapter. Somebody who is exempt means you're not covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act. And what that means is you're not eligible for overtime. That's how we get salaried employees. Non-exempt employees are people who are governed by the Fair Labor Standards Act. You have to be paid overtime. And again, 1.5 times your normal pay, anything over 40 hours a week. I am an exempt employee. I don't get paid an hourly rate. 
How do we determine that stuff? Well, if somebody is an executive or administrative person, somebody works in a managerial role, somebody who's a professional, we're thinking about people like doctors and lawyers, for example, educators, uh, people who do technology work, and even people who do outside sales. Some of those folks only get commission, for example. So you have to really be in a managerial or or in an executive kind of status. But there also are some salary guidelines. This actually changed. Our textbook is incorrect. The current minimum pay per week to, to be exempt is $684 a week, equivalent to about 28 bucks an hour. So in other words, if you want somebody to, to be exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act, and you're calling them a manager, they got to at least make this kind of money to be exempt. Why is this important? Because in the old days, what people would often do, and not just the old days, even today, companies would try to classify everybody as exempt so they could work them as many hours as they wanted without having to pay overtime. It really comes down to how independent are you, what level of independent action you're taking as a manager or creative type. And again, if you're going to make somebody exempt, you better be prepared to pay them at least $684 a week. That's still not uh, big, big money in the United States, although it's a good living wage. So what are some of the things we have to look at? Uh, in terms of compensatory time off, again, some people may not want overtime. If they worked 45 hours, they may want five times one and a half off and make up time. Well, what about the folks uh, who are non-exempt? How do you get them uh, to be more productive while they're working to get within the 40 hours? That can be tough. Uh, if, you're, if you have somebody who's going for training, for example, training time is compensatory time, meaning if you need somebody to do five hours of training on top of the 40-hour work week for the job, you're going to have to pay for it. And again, with things like travel time and after hours work, what, what the current environment we're in right now, if you're an hourly employee and you're checking your email after hours, that technically could be time you're getting paid for, which means employers have to set policies. Otherwise, they maybe have a lot of overtime stacking up they may, may not even realize. Travel time means some people, for example, can get paid traveling in between locations. If I'm driving from St. Francis to St. Vincent, for example, near Latrobe for college business, I get paid for that time if I'm an hourly employee. And donning and doffing time means in some professions like mining and hazardous work, if you have to put on gear, for example, you get paid while you're taking your gear off and on. So we got to really think about what our philosophy is going to be. Some companies have what we refer to as an entitlement philosophy, and that means everybody gets a raise every year just for being there. We refer to that as seniority. That's a very 20th century approach. But it's got some merit in the fact you don't really have to worry about performance management making uh, some people happy and other people's unhappy. The more modern idea is pay for performance. You give people raises and compensate them based on how they're working for your company. When we think about fairness and equity, how do we stack up against other employers? Are our pay rates and raises and ways of rewarding people good compared to our competitors? That's external equity. Internal equity means what about with other people within the organization? Are, are we compensating people fairly between individuals? And that gets into things, for example, like potential violations of things uh, such as equal opportunity employment or sexual discrimination, for example. We pay men more than, than females. There's a, a varying philosophy if you should be open or closed about what you're paying people. Kind of the 21st century approach to this is having transparency and letting people know what the pay rates are. If you work for Amazon, every manager knows what every other manager is making, for example. Why do we have that? Number one, nobody can, can accuse anybody of being discriminatory. If we all know what everybody else is making, it makes people be transparent. And number two, it also gives people a chance to, to look up why they're not making a better wage. Are there ways for me to upgrade the wage I'm making? When, when somebody is paying for competency, that means we're paying for degrees, we're paying for certifications, and, and we, we also call that knowledge-based pay. Skill-based pay means you have a very specific skill that somebody wants. We're not paying for a credential, we're paying for somebody's actual recognized skill. Knowledge-based pay, I've got a degree. Skill-based pay, I can build or do something at a particular level. So we, we have different pay and compensation systems for that. Uh, and a job evaluation, uh, for example, we also call that a, a job uh, appraisal, for example. Our, our, our examples of this mean we go and we evaluate the job. This could be done as part of a job analysis, for example. We, we can see which jobs are most important in our organization, and we classify them into categories. And we have these categories set up so we know how we're going to compensate people. Sometimes they refer to them as pay grades, for example.
so we can do a job evaluation. We can build things what are referred to as compensable factors. In other words, is there a specific task or, or dimension within a job that means somebody should be paid a certain rate? If we've got folks who weld in a company, for example, ability to do spot welds could be a compensable factor. We could break them into levels of skilled welders, a level one, two, or three, for example. The ability to do spot welds is a compensable factor, and the different levels of performance on, on those areas could mean what you're getting paid per hour. Market pricing is the idea of seeing what other people pay, what other companies pay for the same jobs. And we got to think about numbers of things there. Number one is the market we're in and even the geography we're in. What What is acceptable pay in a given geographic area? Because it's going to vary. For example, somebody who's a registered nurse in Altoona, Pennsylvania, probably makes a lot less money than a registered nurse in Washington, D.C. Does that mean somebody in Altoona should make what somebody in Washington, D.C. does? Probably not because we're paying based on what that market will bear and things like cost of living as well. So we can do pay surveys, guys, which means we can go through our organization uh, or even in between organizations to determine are we paying the right amounts. And we can use certain jobs as benchmarks. For example, if we're a factory and the majority of our people work in one or two positions, those could be benchmark jobs that we can pair against other folks. And we can do this through the internet. We can use things, for example, such as ONET to compare pay rates and, and to determine, for example, what people should be getting paid. Now, anytime you go between uh, employers, a couple of employers can go together and say, hey, we want to compare our wages. Uh, what we have to do in this particular scenario, if you want to do this, the National Labor Relations Act says you have to make employees uh, names uh, uh, private so you're not, you're not comparing specific individuals and de-identified. It can be risky, however, to do a pay survey to, to look between companies because what if we find out our competition is paying 10 times what we're paying? Or they, for that matter, find out we're paying 10 times less. They could rate our employees put us out of business and we could find ourselves having to pay a lot money than we think we're capable of paying to stay competitive. So what are pay grades? That means we we take people uh, in jobs into uh, kind of value ranges. People in the same value range go into a certain pay grade. For example, we have somebody who works as a lawn care specialist, somebody who works as a landscaper and somebody else who works uh Moving, uh, moving snow in the wintertime. Maybe they're all the same level of skills that are required. We can put them all in the same pay grade. And what this basically means, guys, is that we are building up pay grades. So don't worry about the other categories other than the idea of, of grouping these things means pay grades. When we, we group people into similar pay grades based on the market, in other, what other companies do. If other colleges, for example, group all their landscapers together in a, a similar pay grade, we refer to that as market banding. So when we get into job grades, we also can use points, for example, to determine if a, a job is within a certain grade. For example, if there are, are seven or eight key points that go into a job and we rate that as a seven, as opposed to somebody who's 14, that means they're in two different pay ranges, for example. When you use fewer pay grades and you are able to promote people within those pay grades, we call that broadbanding. So instead of having 16 different pay grades, we could have eight and we could give some latitude within those based on the points that a person is performing at to give them raises within a within fewer amounts of pay grades. We call that broadbanding. So what about individual pay? Uh, let's say, for example, we've done a pay grade survey and we had pay grades and we determined that uh, we had somebody who was working at our company who somehow is making money that's beyond what they should be making for that job. It happens. So for example, if two companies do a pay pay survey and they readjust their pay grades and their pay scales, some folks who've been there long enough may be making too much money. So that we call that person a red circled employee. Uh, what do you do with that person? Generally speaking, you grandfather them in and let them continue to make the wage. Somebody, for example, who's a green circled employee if you're that employee, you're happy when you get green circle because it means your employer should be giving you a raise. We see that stuff happen all the time as well. Uh, pay compression means when you've got a, a lot of people in different uh, pay grades who really aren't making that much of a different kind of wage. So if we've got several people, we've got, we've got a grade one, two, three, and four, and the difference between pay grades is 10 cents on the dollar, 10 cents on the hour, I should say, then 
those folks don't have a lot of incentive for performance and their their pay compression happens because the the in individual differences between pay grades are rather small and then we have something called salary inversion and when it means that we have new folks who are coming in who are getting better pay rates to start with than our senior employees were getting if you do have a performance based and not an entitlement culture however you should be thinking about how you get your high performers to continue performing well so basically what you're doing is creating a culture where, where you are rewarding people for performance. And so you might give, you know, standard increases to everybody, but the big raises should be rewarded to the people who are making your company go forward. So to do this, we have something called a pay adjustment matrix. And this means we're going to determine uh, based on performance who gets what raises. And again, this ties right into the idea of performance evaluations, performance management, performance appraisal, all those things and determines based on somebody's performance evaluation where do they fall in the pay range so for example if we have uh, folks who are high performers for example and they are exceeding expectations maybe they get a four to six percent pay raise uh, if we have somebody who is meeting expectations maybe they get three to five if they're if they're not performing maybe they don't get anything at all and by the way the quartiles what we're talking about here first, second, third, and fourth, that means compared to the rest of the people in your industry, first quartile are the companies that give the highest rewards, second, less so, third, and fourth, again, et cetera, et cetera. If you are a lower performing company in general, for example, even your high performers may only get small raises. And all of these things are based on where you're at and uh, the employee's performance rating. So what are other ways we can do standard pay adjustments? Seniority, for example, how long have you been here? Well, every year you're here, you get a raise. So seniority can mean some people are making more money. Then we can also get what we call colas. And I don't mean Coke or Pepsi. I mean cost of living adjustments. That means every year, everybody gets a certain percentage raise to try to keep pace with inflation and the cost of living. Uh, and that is also sometimes referred to as across the board increases, which means, for example, the company did really well this year. So everybody gets a 2% raise. So colas are based on the cost of living. Across the board increases mean basically we're giving a raise to everybody because the company has done well. We have more money than we thought we did. We cut costs and so we can give more money back to the employees. Mm. And we get lump sum increases. We can also call those bonuses. That means, for example, uh, you're going to get a big uh, extra payment in your December check because you did well this year or the company did well. Everybody gets a lump sum increase. So other things we can do in terms of compensation tied to performance, we can have incentives so people can 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 work toward, for example, if you sell so many uh, numbers of something, you get a bonus. That's something that's based on individual performance. Uh, and we can also say, for example, if you are uh, giving incentives like this, it can be attractive to the employer because we get better production. And instead of giving somebody a pay increase, like we're going to give you a 25% per hour pay increase, if we give you an incentive, like a bonus or something, it's a one-time payout and doesn't increase our cost over time. Uh, employees, for example, get, get the idea of incentives too, because if they do better, they make more money and they do their jobs better, they can make more. So in terms of uh, variable pay, that means, for example, uh, that we can make different amounts of money based on our performance. Meaning, like, for example, if we are trying to perform better or have higher output, uh, we can see that, that our output will result in better pay down the line. So a variable pay system means that you have line of sight. You can look toward the future. So higher performance equals higher pay. Line of sight means you can see the money down the road. So in terms of things that affect uh, variable pay, for example, uh, critical success factors and key performance indicators. That means there are certain things we want to accomplish within the company. Those would be our criti critical success factors. And the key performance indicators tell us if we've hit those. So a key performance indicator would be less waste, for example. More efficiency would be a key performance indicator, meaning that we could get better pay for everybody. And this could apply to the individual. It could apply to a team or an organization as a whole. Again, if we're going for individuals, you individually working on the line, use less raw materials to produce the goods, less waste, you get a bonus. Your team work together in a certain part of our organization, you get a bonus for the same idea. Or if the whole organization became more efficient, everybody gets a bonus, for example. In terms of individual incentives, uh, you need to be able to tie these incentives to performance in a way that people understand 
And the individual themselves has to have the spirit of working harder. For example, if you have folks who really aren't that motivated and aren't motivated by pay, for example, or rewards, those incentives might not do well for them. Uh, if, if you've got individual uh, incentive systems, too, they don't work well in collectivist kind of, of systems. For example, if you've got a union environment uh, and those folks emphasize things like uh, seniority and entitlement based systems and an individual incentive based system does not fit with that organizational culture as well. So, again, those things are, are very tough to, to, to put in in certain systems. A piece rate system might mean, for example, if you're working in a factory, you get paid a certain wage per hour uh, based on how many pieces you produce. So you might be expected to produce 10 pieces an hour. If you produce 12, you get a little extra. So again, piece rate systems are very common in factories. Uh, a bonus, again, an incentive that's one time, for example, is a bonus that's added on to somebody's base pay. And again, why do we love those things as employers? Because it doesn't result in recurring costs. Employees love them too because they get rewarded for their performance. And we also have incentives that have nothing to do with money. For example, we could get a reward for being a high performer, like a plaque. We could get recognized. Could get a service award. Sometimes you've been there for 25 years. Maybe you get a watch, for example. St. Francis, you get a plaque on the wall. Uh, team incentives, again, uh, we, we can have different incentives for different team members. The same rules apply. It's just the, the idea of doing it in a, a team format. However, what you could do is, in, within a team or an organization it has something called gauge sharing. And again, this is incentive-based pay, can, can take the form of a bonus. Uh, and that means, for example, if we became more productive as a company, everybody gets a little extra that's called gain sharing. We do, however, in this scenario, have people called free riders. Those are folks who still benefit from, from team incentives but didn't put much into it. Sometimes we also call it profit sharing. If the company is more profitable, everybody gets a bonus. Stock option means that maybe if we perform well, Employees get shares of stock in the company, and sometimes even uh, employee-owned companies. For example, some companies are completely owned by their employees who are also shareholders, might get additional shares of stock. Well, then we get into sales compensation. Some folks in sales only get a salary. If you work for certain companies, they don't incentivize cutthroat types of sales. That's one of the bad raps for sales, by the way. People say, well, it's a high-pressure kind of situation. you got to pressure people to buy from you. Oftentimes, that's because of commission. If we have salary only, for example, there was a car company named Saturn that was owned by GM back in the 90s and early 2000s, and there was no commission paid to their salespeople. And as a result, the salespeople tended to be less pushy and people liked the buying experience. On a commission plan, people get paid based on what they sell. And there could be straight commission, which means you only get paid what you sell, very high pressure sales, or salary plus commission means you get a standard base pay plus commission when you sell. Executive compensation is, is, a, is a little different. And again, we talked about the idea of development. Executives, for example, sometimes get bigger incentives for performance. And oftentimes with, with, with executives, too, they're pulling down high salaries, sometimes even non-monetary compensation. Uh, the idea of things that make them more noteworthy or being recognized also apply Oftentimes, executive compensation, though, is tied into performance of the company uh, and things like shares of stock or other kinds of things that are determined by uh, the board of directors, for example, and in compliance, of course, with the Dodd-Frank Act. And guys, that is our very basic explanation of executive compensation uh, as part of our discussion of compensation rewards in general. Hope you enjoyed this presentation.